there is a darkness in humanity that has manifested itself in a lust for blood throughout the ages. The Old Testament and ancient myths catalog murder and revenge as part of the fabric of life in ancient times. Cain slew Abel. Romulus slew Remus. Unleashing the beast within is a possibility for all of us. The decision to kill from passion or premeditation has often defined our world, past, present, and future. Wars have terrorized entire populations for thousands of years. The American West was home to ruthless killers who were idolized in fiction and folklore. Evil evolved to a hideous new form with the genocidal dictators of the 20th century, such as Hitler, Stalin, and Mao Zedong, who ordered the death of tens of millions. But in the middle of the 20th century, a new and chilling phenomenon emerged in post-war Western society, the serial killer. As if fashioned from our nightmares, they terrify and fascinate us. Lurking behind masks of bland normality, they often evade capture for years, decades, or eternity. They are America's serial killers. We killed her. We dumped her body off, and that was it. Nothing to it. Every year in this country, we have about 20 serial killers. 10 of whom are apprehended, 10 of whom are on the loose. And they are, in total, responsible for some 200 deaths. So 200 victims of serial killers on a yearly basis. And what makes this particularly important for us is that the average serial killer is responsible for 10 deaths. That's a huge body count. America's Serial Killers, Portraits in Evil, will strip the covers from a world of profiling and forensic science as we expose America's most brutal serial killers. Catching serial killers has proven to be one of the most difficult tasks facing law enforcement. Serial killers are the best at what they do and can go on killing for years without capture. H. H. Holmes, the doctor of death, killed hundreds in Chicago at the end of the 19th century. At the same time, Jane Topan silently murdered 31 people in New England. After World War II, the Boston Strangler raped hundreds and killed 13 before capture. Ted Bundy killed as many as 45 women in four states spanning two years. John Wayne Gacy snatched 33 young men and boys from Chicago's streets before the stench of dead bodies in his basement unveiled his murderous lifestyle. California's freeway killers produced a roadside killing field from 1971 to 1983. And Henry Lee Lucas may have killed as many as 300 before his capture. Many murder cold cases are now believed to be the work of serial killers. Well, certainly a lot of cold case murders could be the product of serial killers. I have one right now from 1954 that I believe is a, one of the, the first victims of a serial killer. So 
Um, before this phenomenon was identified, certainly there could be cases that were missed and thought to be just a single event or maybe two events put together in the same town where actually it's a series of events that have taken place over some distance and some time. The combination with DNA plus the fact that more and more agencies are developing cold case squads. They are, to some extent, ironically, mimicking television, which I find interesting. Uh, but also there seems to be more pressure on the police department from survivors to, you know, solve these cases, particularly if they see it solved on TV. So there's pressure from the uh, the public who watch these TV programs on television, and there's also some ideas that come across for the uh, agencies themselves, which is a good thing. I guess that's a, something good the media has done. Indeed, almost every night, some serial killer is caught on TV. The media has made it look easy to catch a serial killer. But two of the most infamous serial killers of all time were never caught nor identified. Jack the Ripper mutilated and killed five women in 19th century London over a four month time span. His killings terrorized a city. He even wrote notorious letters to the police, taunting them. The next job I do, I shall clip the ladies' ears off and send to the police officers. Just for jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work, then give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp, I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck. Jack played with them. You'll hear about Saucy Jack's work tomorrow. Double event this time. Number one squealed a bit. Couldn't finish straight off. <sighs> Not the time for ears for police. In spite of a huge public outcry to nab this murderous fiend, in the end, he vanished into the night and was never caught nor identified. Similarly, the serial killer known as the Zodiac, who terrorized California's Bay Area in the 1960s, was never caught nor identified. He killed six people and wounded two others. His M.O. was daring daylight murders in public places. And like the Ripper, he wrote letters and taunted the police. You will find the kids in a brown car. I shot them with a nine millimeter Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. But in the end, after intense efforts by police and the press to bring him to justice, the Zodiac eluded capture and may still be alive today. Another serial murderer that many thought would forever elude capture was the killer known as BTK. BTK stood for bind, torture, and kill. It was the AKA for a serial killer who murdered 10 victims between 1974 and 1991 in Wichita, Kansas, and then suddenly stopped. This case raised the question why it's been so hard for law enforcement to catch actual serial killers when it seems so easy on TV shows. The reasons will surprise and startle you. The 1991 movie, The Silence of the Lambs, made a star out of a sadistic but brilliant serial killer named Hannibal Lecter, the much admired anti-hero of crime. But in reality, serial killers are anything but anti-heroes. At the bottom level, serial killing comes down to a really ugly, horrible, violent act about which nothing is funny, 
nothing is entertaining, nothing is charming, right? And it is a testament to the writers who created him and the actor who portrayed him that Hannibal Lecter pulls it off so incredibly successfully. But I think that, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm sanguine about Hannibal Lecter. I think he's a great character. I don't feel a sense of anger that, that a serial killer is portrayed in some sort of way. Because I think really we all understand, you know, uh, uh, you know, when you watch a, a you know, when you watch Wiley Coyote getting blown up, you know, you know, an actual coyote isn't being injured, right? Okay, we understand that Hannibal Lecter is a is a, a character who has been created to play with our emotions and our intellect and our sense of humor, and he does it in an incredibly great way. But I think we all understand that the reality that underlies that is that serial murder isn't any of those things that he represents. In fact, serial killers not only cause incomparable suffering and terror for their victims, torturing them and cutting their lives short, but they also produce long-term pain and grief for the friends and relatives of the victims. I think it's unfortunate that the sensationalistic nature of murder sometimes shifts our attention to the perpetrator. We become preoccupied with the heinous details of the crime and sometimes forget that there are lots of ripples in that pond. Perhaps some of it is the victim is dead. But I know from years of experience that there are many victims beyond the deceased. I meet with the surviving spouse, the surviving children, the surviving parents. Those are anguished discussions. This anguish is not felt by the serial killer for his victims. As everyone learned, the Wichita serial killer Dennis Rader, BTK, talked about his victims as if they were objects. And I don't think it was actually the person that I was after. I think it was the dream. Uh, I know that's not really nice to say about a person, but they were basically an object. They were just an object. That's how it worked. Dennis Rader was not a brilliant serial killer. He was just good at killing. One of the reasons serial killers are hard to catch is that they are good at what they do. Just as a taxicab driver is good at driving, serial killers are good at killing. People sometimes wonder, well, why aren't they caught? Well, some people are very skilled at flying below radar. They're very furtive in their strategies. They're very calculating. Most homicides are solved within 48 hours. But these guys can get away with murder and stay on the loose over long periods of time. It's a self-selection process. The ones who were not excellent killers are caught almost immediately. The ones who get away with murder and, and are able to amass the body count that deserves to be labeled serial murder uh, are the ones who have the street smarts to stay on the loose. And of course, another way to think about this in terms of prison versus outside, it's the less intelligent or dumb prisoners that are in prison. It's the smart ones who never get there because they never get caught. Such was the case with BTK. Bind, torture, kill. The signature of the BTK killer, Dennis Lynn Rader. From 1974 to 1991, Rader carved these initials into the Wichita, Kansas community and brought the meaning of sheer terror to this quiet city of 300,000. He looked from the outside like any other guy in town. A family man, married with two children. He was a Boy Scout leader, a deacon in the Christ Lutheran Church, and president of the church council. But inside, he was an angry psychopath. 
a small, sly man whose show of community spirit and caring was a sham. He didn't give a damn about anyone. To Dennis Rader, the innocent were objects he terrorized to feel powerful. Rader was born in 1945, and as a boy showed many of the warning signs of a potential serial killer. Like a number of other serial killers, he tortured animals, binding them with bailing wire and hanging them in a barn. As a young man, he dressed in women's underwear and at times hung a noose around his neck. These elements would later form part of his notorious bind, torture, kill signature. After four years in the Air Force, he returned to Wichita in 1970. He earned an associate degree in electronics and later worked for the alarm company, ADT Security Services. It was here that he learned how to circumvent home security systems, enabling his home invasion, modus operandi. On January 15, 1974, his serial killing began. That year, he murdered Joseph and Julie Otero and two of their five children, Joseph Otero II and Josephine. BTK broke into their home with what he called his hit kit. Plastic bags, rope, tape, knife. and gun. He held the Oteros at gunpoint while he tied them up. Next, starting with the father, he tortured them by first suffocating them with plastic bags and then finally killing them by strangulation with a ligature. Over the next 17 years, six more victims followed, all of them women. Catherine Bright, Shirley Vion, Nancy Fox, Maureen Hedge, Vicki Wagerly, and Dolores Davis. Each one was murdered with the same bind, torture, and kill signature. Police were baffled, and Wichita was terrorized. But Raider wanted more than just to panic the community. He wanted celebrity. So, like Son of Sam and the Zodiac Killer before him, he sent chilling letters to the police and media. Then, inexplicably, in 1991, BTK stopped killing. After 10 victims, he vanished. No more letters, no more taunting. The police had only one lead, a lead provided by a new investigation tool, geographical profiling, a technique pioneered by D. Kim Rosmo. And he took that little crumb of an idea that that Dr. Newton had and developed it into a full-blown doctoral thesis with a lot of algorithms on a special uh, computer, special piece, uh, personal computer that would allow someone to pinpoint the center of operation or the home of the killer or the rapist. In the case of BTK, all the Wichita police knew for certain was that the killer was limited to the small geographical area of Greater Wichita. This would turn out to be a very important piece of information that narrowed down the suspect pool. But even with the help of geographical profiling, by 2004, it appeared that BTK 
like Jack the Ripper, like the Zodiac Killer, had gotten away scot-free. However, though Raider was good at killing, he was not a Hannibal Lecter genius. In fact, it was his need to feel powerful again that would be his undoing. BTK, Dennis Raider in Wichita, Kansas, was on the loose for 30 years. Uh, he had stopped killing years earlier, but he was no longer getting the publicity that made him feel so good about himself. And so he started writing to the press, sending letters to the um, to television reporters and taunting the police with cryptic clues. And that's how he was caught. He was caught not because he was killing anybody, because he had controlled his behavior, maybe because he didn't want to get caught and he felt that they were going to close in on him if he wasn't careful. But whatever the reason, he got caught because he simply couldn't tolerate the obscurity and in sent a floppy disk through the mail that was traced back to the church where he had created it. He didn't know, like a lot of other people who don't understand technology, that you can trace back the source of a, of a floppy that is made on a PC a desktop. Police now had a suspect. Their investigation had revealed that BTK owned a black Jeep Cherokee. Detectives spotted one in Raider's driveway, but they needed more. They compared DNA found at the crime scene of Vicki Wagerly with Dennis Raider's daughter's DNA. It was a familial match. Police closed in and on February 25th, 2005, they arrested Dennis Rader. The infamous BTK killer was caught. But the main reason many serial killers are not caught is that they choose victims from the fringes of society. Victims that will not be missed or cared about. I wanted to kill as many women I thought were prostitutes as I possibly could. These are the words of Gary Ridgway, also known as the Green River Killer. It's a case that highlights the second reason serial killers are so hard to catch. Serial killers kill people they don't know. For them, Killing is the primary object. Unlike murders committed during the execution of a crime, such as a robbery or a drug deal, or murders of revenge or punishment, as in a mob hit, or murders that are crimes of passion, for serial killers, their murders stand alone. In this sense, anybody will do. That's what makes the serial killer so frightening. Anybody could be their next victim. Son of Sam shot and killed six strangers. The Boston Strangler murdered 13 women in the 1960s. And Ted Bundy brutally bludgeoned to death at least 45 women women he didn't know until the day of their death. All of these killers didn't know any of their victims. This makes them particularly hard to catch as there is no relationship between a serial killer and his or her targets. Nothing to tie them together. In the cases of these well-known serial killers, the victims were ordinary people. You know, you look at serial killers who did not kill prostitutes or people on the fringes of society. Those cases got a lot of attention, and very quickly. 
Um, you know, you look at, at Ramirez and what he did. Um, there was a, a killer who operated out of um, uh, San Francisco who murdered people on the trails of Mount Tamalpais. Here's another guy. These were, you know, fairly well off white people. Uh, um, uh, there was a hue and cry immediately about capturing this guy. But many serial killers choose victims that are known in criminology as the quote-unquote less dead. Male and female prostitutes. Teenage runaways. The lone hitchhiker. You know, it goes back to my concept of, of the less dead, because if you're blowing people off, if you're considering them throwaways, as a police department, and that's not necessarily the police department's fault because the public feels the same way. And they don't put enough pressure on the police to deal with these kinds of cases. Detectives are getting cases all the time in a, in a large metropolitan area, homicide detectives. And it comes in that a, that a prostitute has been killed, there's no witnesses, they don't have any information, they can't even identify the prostitute except the way she's dressed, they think she was walking in the area. And she was killed in the area. She was picked up and killed in the area. They have no more information than that. They know that that's gonna be a very difficult case to solve. The probability is very low, which is referred to as solvability factors. So they're gonna put their, uh, that case on the bottom of the pile. You know, there's people that society values more for whatever reason and uh, um, that mere fact is part of what allows these killers to get to the victims that they want and to get away with doing what they want for as long as they do. No case better illustrates this point than the case of the Green River Killer, America's most prolific documented serial killer. The search for the infamous Green River Killer began on July 15, 1982, after the body of Opal Charlene Mills was discovered on the banks of the Green River, a quiet little stream south of Seattle, Washington. It was along the secluded banks of this river that Gary Leon Ridgway, AKA the Green River Killer, disposed of his victims. His M.O. was simple. The Green River Killer is a repeat of a very common thread in serial murder in that the overwhelming majority, if not all of his victims, were prostitutes. Um, and uh, he, brought, he took them from a place in the urban environment where they were picked up out into the country. He dumped their bodies often in the same location, multiple victims in the same location. Um, because of, you know, he, he, he evaded uh, forensic, um, any discovery of forensic evidence by, you know, uh, depositing the bodies in places where they weren't immediately discovered, uh, where time would allow, you know, animal depredation and the, the decomposition of the victim, or he, he put them in water so that, you know, ev potential evidence could be washed away. As the bodies piled up, more than 50 in less than 10 years, and no evidence could be found, Seattle police hoped profiling would help them put away their killer. Profile's a tool. What, what the public doesn't understand is a profile provides a tool to narrow the possible group of suspects. Because frequently in a serial murder investigation, who are your suspects? Everyone. If you can look at a crime scene, look at the victim, look at all the information the police have gathered, and come up with a type of person you think may have committed this crime, which is really what a profile is, then you have narrowed their group of suspects to a manageable number as opposed to everyone. The FBI originated profiling and touted it as a breakthrough science to stop serial killers. On the outside, it looked like a brilliant idea, but it had flaws. Part of the last resort 
uh, approach that the FBI takes is to use profiling. And I think you have to keep in mind when you evaluate behavioral profiling uh, that it is often used as a last resort uh, in the most difficult cases of all. But it doesn't always work. Uh, sometimes it does, but sometimes it's, it leads to irrelevant information and it can even mislead. The, the profile of the Green River Killer, although fairly general, I think was of some assistance to the police in the Pacific Northwest that, you know, that worked that case for years. But uh, as to a profile really narrowing it down, I can't really think of any, to be honest with you. A profile's a tool. So profiling is not the wonder tool as portrayed on television. Indeed, some criminologists believe the FBI used it merely as a means to increase their budget. The real advances in serial killer capture turn out to be meticulous crime scene investigation and advances in forensic science, particularly the use of DNA. The changes that I've seen in forensic science are absolutely astounding. Back in the day, we used to collect blood at a scene and hopefully be able to type it and maybe come up with the killer's blood type but it didn't really tell us who the killer was. We had something to match it to and it would be a consistent with, but it wouldn't necessarily tell us who the killer was. Or you would have uh, saliva or other bodily fluids left at a scene where you could determine if that person was a secretor or a non-secretor. Again, you can eliminate about a third of the population, but it still doesn't tell you who your suspect is. Um, now, with, especially with the advent of computers and the technology and DNA, those two things have vaulted us into the 21st, 22nd, 23rd century because of the things that we're able to do. And, and especially with DNA, it's technology that's changing almost daily. They're able to amplify DNA more so than they ever have been able to do. I've been able to get DNA, not me personally, but uh, a lab that I use has been able to get DNA from bones that have been buried for, for 52 years, 53 years. Um, they were able to get DNA from those bones and not only get DNA, but to develop a profile from it. And so they're able to take that profile and enter it into a database so that if uh, a maternal relative of that person is ever located and their DNA entered, it'll come up as a hit on that. Um, so DNA is probably one of the biggest things that, that we rely on. Uh, one of the other things that's really coming along with DNA also is what's called touch DNA. And we're starting to, um, to do this more at property crime scenes, not just where there's blood or bodily fluids or anything like that. If you have fingerprints at a crime scene, you probably have DNA. And so you can take a photograph of that fingerprint and then swab that fingerprint and submit that to the lab and develop a DNA profile just from that fingerprint. In many ways, the future started with the Green River Killer case. DNA evidence proved the Seattle police case against Gary Leon Ridgway the man they had for years suspected, but could not nail for the murders. Well, Signature and the Green River case uh, was not really as important as DNA. Uh, it, as it turned out, as some suspected, including the profiler, uh, Ridgeway returned to his crime scenes fairly often, and in most instances had sex with corpses. In other words, he was a necrophiliac, and almost all of his victims. The final reason serial killers elude capture for so long is called linkage blindness. It is a little known fact that America has the most complex and decentralized law enforcement jurisdiction system in the world. And these separate jurisdictions are often reluctant to share information. So when serial killers like Ted Bundy began roaming and murdering from Washington state to Florida, it created major problems for law enforcement. Tying his multiple murders together and deciding who had legal jurisdiction presented almost insurmountable problems. Most police jurisdictions are reluctant to involve the FBI in their investigations of serial murder. Um, 
first of all, police want to take credit. And uh, notoriously, one police department is unlikely to collaborate with another police department, whether it's at the local, state, or federal level. This decentralization, which is based upon uh, federalism and which is based upon people want to have control over their own police force because they pay taxes for it, because it is decentralized in that manner, uh, causes this lack of communication to occur for a variety of reasons. Some are, you can blame on the investigator, some you can blame on the administration. Uh, in other cases, it's, it's just a simple fact that we have a lot of jurisdictions involved. Uh, that creates a big problem. And I've seen linkage blindness occur in almost every serial murder investigation that I've looked at, at least initially. Some uh, investigations have very rapidly uh, recognized what they're dealing with and formed a, a task force, which is what they typically do, and move ahead in investigating a serial murder. However, historically most serial killers like BTK and the Green River Killer have been caught not by task forces, dogged police work, forensics, or profiling, but by dumb luck. Or when the serial killer gets arrogant and sloppy. What happens with a serial killer frequently is they become uh, lax. They feel a feeling of omnipotence. You know, they're, they can do no wrong because they're successful over a number of times and not leaving any evidence or not much and the police are stumped, so they take shortcuts. They get cocky. They make mistakes. And frequently, that's when they're caught. No case illustrates this point better than the case of Joel Rifkin. New York City's most prolific killer, killing 17 women between 1989 and 1993. He didn't have a license plate on the back of his truck, a cab over. This was in New York. The state highway uh, police chased him for a short period of time and pulled him over. And they were going to issue him a ticket, and they smelled something funny in the back. A cab over pickup. They went to the back and opened it, and there was a decomposing dead body in the in the back of the truck. Now he consequently, or subsequently, uh, admitted to killing 17 women. Most of them prostitutes in the New York area. A lot of them stuffed in drums and buried or simply thrown into New Jersey flats, a you know waste industrial area in New York, New Jersey area. And that was luck. Nobody knew that was going on. Nobody even knew that there was a serial killer involved with killing prostitutes at that time. However, the days of the American serial killer easily evading capture for years may be over. Inspired by the atrocities of earlier serial killers, a new breed of serial killer detective has arisen. Well, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area in the 1960s and early 70s, and that was the heyday of the Zodiac Killer. And, and I was always fascinated with, with what he did, because obviously it was in the newspaper weekly or bi-weekly, and, and he was he was constantly challenging the detectives. Dave Toshi was one of them. And uh, he constantly challenged them in the newspapers. And I just thought uh, that that line of work, to try and track somebody like that and find them, would be absolutely fascinating. And additionally, I wanted to be a policeman since I was really little. So those two things, that fascination and, and the desire to do it, uh, kind of led me to where I am now. Detective Steve Ainsworth is one of that new breed of serial killer detectives who cares about the victims first and foremost. He communicates with fellow law officials across the country and uses the latest in forensics, crime scene investigation procedures and techniques, and he pours over national criminal databases. One of the cases that I'm working on right now is a, is a cold homicide from 1954 where uh, a young lady was found naked and beaten, or, or she was reported as being beaten, uh, on a creek bed up one of the canyons. Uh, she was buried ultimately as a Jane Doe, and no killer was ever identified, and she was never identified. Well, through the investigation, 
um, we've determined that he, she is possibly one of the first victims of Harvey Glattman, who was a serial killer in the late 1950s in Southern California. Harvey was investigated and interviewed and ultimately convicted by Pierce Brooks. Um, I, this is the case right here, and this is uh, the Jane Doe case. And uh, if you want to, we can go back and take a look at uh, where all of this takes place. Harvey Glattman is executed in 1959. And so everything that's known about him, or everything that's going to be known about him, at least up until now, is somewhere in the Internet. And I've been able to obtain that through uh, Internet contacts, Internet sources, and also through the court files. Almost all of that was available on here. Um, there's another resource that we use called LEO Online. It's basically Law Enforcement Officer Online. And um, you can access not only different databases through that, but you can actually talk to homicide investigators throughout the country and, and, and really throughout the world as far as um, what your MO is, if you have the signature, if you have something that you haven't seen before, like frequently we'll see people that will send out a photograph of a tattoo or a photograph of a tagging or something like that and say, does anybody know what this is or does anybody know what this means? So between those two things that we talked about before, the computer and DNA, it's, it's shot us, rocketed us into the 22nd century. And what about Detective Ainsworth's cold case, potentially involving America's first signature serial killer, Harvey Glattman? Should his body count go up by one? Was it Glattman that killed her? Basically, um, judging from the interviews that were done with him, judging from the, his MO and from his signature and the way our victim was found, I believe very strongly that it was Harvey Glattman. I'm more confident of who the killer is than actually of who the victim is because we still don't know who she is at this point. So many lost souls whose friends and families will never have closure. So many cold cases. So many victims of serial killers unknown and cases unsolved.